This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the life of David. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. At the same time, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us. Let's pray. <clears throat> well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and everything you provided so we can study your word. We do ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, we studied through Saul's reign, noting some of his failures that led to his rejection as king. His days, or you might say years, are numbered. We learned of him doing a sacrificial ritual, of which ritual he was not supposed to do. It was actually reserved for Samuel, according to his instructions. That is, Samuel's instructions. Because of that, Samuel tells him in chapter 13, verse 14, But now your kingdom will not endure, meaning he would not have a dynasty. His son wouldn't be the next king. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commands. So Saul knows that his time is coming to an end and that his replacement has already been chosen. Later, during his reign, he's commanded to annihilate the Malachites, including the animals. That means men, women, children, and the animals. He withheld killing the king, his name was Agag, and then allowed his men to preserve the best of the animals, and they claimed that was for the purposes of sacrifice. Samuel comes back, tells him where he's been wrong. Let's look at that passage again, or at least maybe more than we read last time. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you not pounce, that is, take advantage, acquire it? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Malachites and brought back Agag, their king. So notice what Saul does. He justifies what Samuel actually called evil. When he didn't act correctly according to the Lord's will, the Lord's will would be best for the people of Israel, he actually allowed evil to continue in the land. And this in itself, this allowance, was evil. Verse 21, he admits, the soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Notice how he puts it in kind of a reversal, personal way here. Your God, the Lord, your God, not the Lord, our God, your God. We're going to take care of your God. But you see, that's not what God wanted him to do. Verse 22, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed, which means listen, is better than the fat of rams. Now listen, folks, this is a great lesson for us. Obedience is more important than any sacrificial ritual we go through. Going to church, singing the songs, going into some sort of ministry of some sort. Unless you're being obedient that's not something that pleases the God, that pleases the Lord, you see. Saul in his own mind thought he knew what would please the Lord. He was wrong. He started out disobeying. You can't please the Lord by disobeying him. Now that seems so obvious, but sometimes people think, we think that this must be what God wants. I knew a man who had been through, I guess, at least one or two divorces. He was on another one. And he rarely saw this woman because she lived overseas in a foreign country, of course. And uh, he was here in the United States. I didn't know if they'd seen him for a year. And I kind of asked him, what's going on? He says, well, we're just 
divorcing. And his justification seemed to be, well, the Lord would want me unhappy. He wants you to be obedient. You've got it reversed, you see. He's got it, he had it reversed. You obey the Lord, let him bring the happiness, whether it be in a relationship or position or maybe even possessions. The first priority is always obedience. It's not some thing that we think we can do that pleases God. In this case, it was a religious ritual by Saul. Listen to verse 23. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Divination is going to another god to find out their will. So basically, how's he doing that? Well, he's not going to do, he's not going to do what God says to do. He's going to do what he thinks is best. So he's doing what his, his own will wants to do. His will, not God's. And notice, an arrogance like the evil of idolatry. He's serving his own pride. Folks, there's a potential for any of us to do this. The way to stay within the bounds of God's will is obedience. The last sentence, but because you have rejected the word of the Lord. Notice, the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Now, how many times have I emphasized and has said that is one of the main goals of this ministry is to get the word out so people can obey it. You learn it, you believe it, and you obey it. You apply it. That's the idea. Well, this is where we continue from our last lesson. Verse 24. Listen to what Saul says to Samuel. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Well, that's his answer on the surface. We just got through seeing before it had to be the sin of div divination as well as the, the arrogance that goes on, the evil of arrogance, the idolatry. He goes on, verse 25, Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Well, now he wants Samuel's support to get right with the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of God, and the Lord has rejected you asking over Israel. Has rejected you asking, excuse me, as king over Israel. <clears throat> My eyes are a little blurry this morning. Verse 27. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of him, caught, caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Verse 28. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. Notice the tearing of the robe, the tearing of the kingdom. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, someone else around you, to one better than you. That's not one. That's not one something. That's not something a king would want to hear, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. Well, then we see Saul trying to get back in with the Lord's favor by appealing through Samuel. So that's what's going on here. Saul replied then, we're just about to wrap Saul's life up, at least this aspect of this part of it. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. See, he wants back in on Samuel's coattails, we might say. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of the Malachites. Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, Surely the bitterness of death is past. That's what Agag, Agag thought. Maybe I'll be okay now. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. 
Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. So Samuel has to come in and do what Saul should have done to make things right. Saul was still wrong and that he didn't do this himself. He should went, went back right away and killed off all those animals, including killing off the king Agag. Well, this does not do much for the relationship between Samuel and Saul. Chapter 15 ends with Samuel himself, as we just saw, killing Agag. Samuel and Saul depart each other, and Samuel did not see Saul again. Verse 35. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The way Saul ruled was not good for Israel. It didn't better Israel's relationship with the Lord, certainly the, not the king's. And this puts Samuel in a tough spot because he was supposed to help Saul rule over God's people. But Saul kept being disobedient. And these major violations are listed here. Now, we don't know the period of time this covered. It may have taken years between these wars. Just think of the time travel and the gathering of people to the cities and stuff like that. That didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in a few hours. Sometimes it might take days for people to gather in a place. And then the organization and so on and the strategy thought up and then they move on and, and you have war after war over the years. So we're talking about a period of perhaps 10 years that this, these incidents happened. We're not told. We don't give a date. But we do know that Saul reigned about 40 years. It doesn't seem that way when you just read his life like we have in just, you know, a couple of lessons. Now, we're not done with it, of course, but this part of it is him being uh, the honored king before the Lord. Well, that's going to end soon. He's on his way out. Now, God did choose Saul for the people. They wanted a ruler. He gave it to them. It was the kind of ruler they would want, tall and handsome. The Lord had him develop a little bit, you know, after he pulled him out of the, uh, the supply, so he'd come out and be recognized, which tells you something about his character. Uh, not someone that was depending on the Lord right away, because you get your courage from the Lord when he has you in a situation where he wants you to do something. You don't think you can do it? Well, depend on him. You can do it. You can always do it if that's what he wants you to do, and you depend on him. Don't forget that. That's really pretty basic. You can't even study the Word of God properly without depending on Him. Well, Saul was enabled by the Spirit to rule. Uh, he was enabled to do things God's way as he got the Word from Samuel, passed on from the Lord. But Saul wouldn't do it. But let's put it in perspective. Saul did have his successes as well, but his failures is what gets him. That's what takes him down. His heart began to stray from obedience, and that was required to keep him as, keep him as God's king over Israel, the people of Israel. He made some key bad decisions that led to his rejection. Now, as I just pointed out, these decisions could have been years apart. But they were devastating. He would be phased out as king, and a new king would be introduced, and now he knows there's one on the scene. Now, why do we say this took some 40 years of his reign? Well, the numbers are given. Earlier we saw. And as the Bible often does, it condenses and brings out the highlights of what we need to know. That's what we've been looking at, the highlights. And this is what I wanted you to see before David comes on the scene, which is the next chapter. What I'm trying to do here, and of course, teachers don't always tell the students what he's trying to do, but I'm trying to get you a feel, that's the best way I can put it, for this time, this era, 
the, the way it was to live in those days. Of course, I can very limited because we just have a limited amount of information to be precise, but to live under a king was the main way, the main government of all the countries in the world that we know of at that time. They had some sort of ruler who was basically taken care of as long as he could command the army and make the right decisions to keep the people, at least to some degree, happy, he could stay as king. And he wasn't even keeping them happy. If he had enough control, he could stay as king anyway. But remember, Saul was the king of Israel. God did not want his people uh, ruled badly. After all, they represent his kingdom, there to spread the message about him. And if you have a bad ruler, which can be devastating to a country, this is what's happening in the United States right now. We have a terrible president and administration that's doing just about everything imaginable wrong. And the people are hurting in many ways. Yes, that's a political opinion. But it's a fact. This affects our lives. I expect it affects yours if you live in the United States. That things have changed. Standard of living has went down. Quality of living has went down just in a year. And if you have a tight budget, you realize it even more. It's been a tough year. Not just because of COVID. I think COVID is a, well, that's another story. But yes, there's some connection, but that's not what's causing all of this. It's bad decisions. COVID doesn't cause the borders to open up in the southern United States and a couple of million people come in illegally. And many aren't even tested for any kind of COVID, so to speak. So what does that tell you? Well, my point is that rulers affect the people. And I want you to understand that Saul was having a negative effect upon Israel now, and it's time for him to get out. He had refused the Lord's commands, his enablement, and he's going to lose that. He's going to lose that soon. It's not even going to be available for him to use. So as we come on this scene with the life of David, Saul is king. The Philistines are still hostile towards Israel. That goes on for a long time. But as I said, Saul is king. Well, it's time for Samuel to go recognize and have the people recognize David as the next king. Chapter 16 opens with the Lord telling Samuel to quit mourning over Saul. 16.1. Now, now we're going to move into the verse by verse. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have chosen for myself a king among his sons. We're not told specifically why Samuel was still mourning over Saul, whether it be his kingship, his dynasty, uh, the pain he's caused, his disobedience. Whatever the reason or reasons, the Lord steps in and gives a mild rebuke to Samuel and tells him to stop. Get on with anointing the next king. The term Bethlehemite, of course, means he's from Bethlehem. The scripture tells us repeatedly that the next Messiah would come from Bethlehem. It was well known later on. Um, we know that David was from Bethlehem. This is what part of the story we're about to enter. Uh, later, he's promised a descendant who would have the throne of the kingdom established forever through the Davidic uh, covenant, Second Samuel seven thirteen. 
This was announced later through the prophets, Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, and Micah 5, 2. And Micah is quoted by the Magi in Matthew 2, 4 through 6, as knowing that the next Messiah would come from Bethlehem, which led to the slaughter of the infants. Matthew also clarifies that Jesus was born in the line of David from the genealogy of chapter 1. So once David comes on the scene, we know he's from Bethlehem. Major point, it comes up again and again, further confirming that the Messiah, which we know now, the Davidic covenant, will come through David's line. And as I just said, confirmed in the Matthew genealogy. Look at Micah 5.2 for a moment. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, that's the clan, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins from of old, from ancient times. So, by the way, that Ephrathah, that's one of the clans within Judah, if you ever wondered what that was. Let's go back to our verse, 16.1. We're not done with it yet. He goes on to say, Last line, for I have chosen for myself a king among his sons. All right, this is Jesse's sons. Uh, the word for chosen is the word actually see, as see, have seen, and have picked the one he wants. That's the idea. Now, understand there's a long time, time span before Saul is finally set aside as king. An abrupt, abrupt change is not the Lord's way when it comes from Saul to David. David would have to go through a period of tough testing and training to get him ready to be the king over Israel. This period of training is also a transition period between the first two kings of Israel, where a number of important things will happen. I never know exactly how God's going to work things out sometimes, and I can just speak for myself. That sometimes that transition period is a long time, years, before God moves you where you feel like you're really being effective for him. You may go through 10, 15, 20 years of not seeing many results. Uh, in your service to God or in your ministry. You may not find a job you like or that you can even stand. But I think eventually if people do the Lord's will, they'll look back and say, well, that was all part of my training to get where I am now. And I think you begin to realize that God was with you that whole time. Those bad experiences, experiences those evil people, those health issues, uh, financial, uh, might have been conflict with people. All these things are moving you towards where God wants you to go. Now, David talks about this later in his life. He fought the uh, lion. He fought the bear. He'll fight Goliath. Uh, he's a warrior from early youth something he'd need to be later on. We're going to see in this part of the story, he's still keeping the sheep. He's a shepherd, but as a shepherd, he learns things. How long was he a shepherd? Well, certainly I would say for years. Probably as early as they could put a young man out there to watch over the sheep and fight off the wolves or whatever else attacked. So you had to be responsible early in life. Now, there's a lot of lessons here, folks, 
not only for us as adults, but for our children to learn that God trains us. And sometimes, often, it's not things we'd prefer to do. Well, I don't want to do that. But should you? Yes, I don't really want to work at that place. Do you need to work? Do you need to make a living? Do you need to, do be, do you need to be doing something productive? Yes. So you take on whatever job you can sometime. Well, I can tell you all sorts of personal stories about that. One of my first jobs uh, working in a, uh, uh, a soda where they made, uh, they made actually it was, RC, it was an RC company, if you remember that, that goes way back. They made some of your best grape drinks and your other type of drinks. Uh, they're the ones that started out with Diet Right. That was the first diet soda, if you remember that. At any rate, I worked in the bottling plant, first cleaning bottles. Sorting them, actually. We sorted them, then they washed them. So I went back there with a team of high schoolers, and we, about I think there was about eight of us, sorting bottles as they came in, as they used to turn in their bottles. I just did that for a couple of months. Then I worked, went to work for a grocery store. But uh, I didn't actually mind that job. It was making money. I actually had some real money. You know, I'd been a paper boy and mowed lawns, but uh, this time I was really getting some money. But those are all sort of, in one way or another, training. I say sort of because you don't really view them as training. You just say, this is my job. But it teaches you things. It teaches you responsibility and people depending on you. Are you a leader? Do you stand out? Or well, they pulled me out of cleaning bottles and put me in the plant itself. I was the only one I know of they did that, at least the time I was there. I just worked hard, that's all. And that follows the rules we've learned in the Proverbs. You work hard, God will promote you. He will benefit you. You will make some money. Not always true. Sometimes you have a, a boss. I've had those too who don't recognize good workers. They just don't like you, so they don't promote you for some reason or another. You don't agree with all their arrogant statements and their, their, preposterous, their preposterous ideas on what you need to do and the way you need to think. I could go into that too, but this is all part of growing up and then as an adult training for what God has you to do. At the same time, you are always in the back of your mind saying, Lord, lead me, guide me, and you're being obedient. You're never perfect in this, but at the same time, well, like Saul, you never get way out of line. Say, I'm just not going to do this, God, period. And then turn around and do the opposite or do evil, which is what Saul was doing. And he had had enough. You might say the Lord is going to stop him now. He'd had his run. He'd done his damage. Hadn't destroyed Israel. Uh, that's a good side of it. They were still around. They'd won some battles and lost some battles. But now they're ready to go up a notch as far as God's people and the nations of the world. Much of our training, our transition, has to do with God's timing, as we see here in the life of Saul and David. God will not put a half-baked king over his people Israel. The world will see what God can do with a person who responds to him and lives an obedient life. I remember when I learned this about David many years ago that I would tell myself, is that me? Am I the one that God's going to see as being obedient? I hope that would be true, but then I again did see my own failures and setbacks. But if you want to be successful as a Christian and you fail, you get up and you keep going again. You confess your sin, whatever it is, Depend on his strength and get up and move again. This is what David does. That's a sign of greatness. It's a sign of greatness. Israel had paid dearly rejecting the Lord as their one and only king. The Lord allowed them to go through Saul. 
their rejection of God's best for them turned sour with Saul. But now the Lord has something much better in mind. That person would be loyal to him, would be loyal to the Lord, and that would be David. So the Lord will send Samuel to Jesse and Bethlehem with the knowledge that the king was among his sons. Now Samuel had a problem with that because he knew that Saul was not in the mood to be replaced. Listen to verse 2. Now remember, this is a prophet of God. He's done all sorts of courageous things, but he didn't want to die. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Saul's condition was that if he heard this, he would kill God's prophet. So what Samuel says is, is true. If Saul learned that Samuel was going to anoint his successor, he'd go after Samuel. You see, Saul wasn't ready to step down, even though he's been told he's been rejected as king. He didn't step aside. Well, the Lord reminds Samuel of another reason to go to Bethlehem, and that was it was time to do a sacrifice, a fellowship sacrifice. That's what this is. So understand the Lord is not making this up just to cover Samuel going to Bethlehem. That's part of the process. They had what they call a fellowship sacrifice where they took a part of the sacrifice and ate it at a meal uh, with invited guests. And this goes in conjunction with the anointing, which would be by uh, the inv invitations would come, excuse me, the guests would come by invitation only. Fellowship offerings mentioned in Leviticus 3.1. So listen to his next point of instruction. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Now, we didn't get much detail on a similar thing that happened with Saul. But I did mention the special dinner and the honoring of Saul shortly before his anointing back in 922 and following. Remember, Samuel had a special piece of meat to share with Saul, and he brought it out, and they had a meal. So this meat was set aside for this occasion. Apparently it was a sacrificial, a sacrificial piece of meat. And so it would be eaten at this dinner at the same time Saul was recognized as someone to be honored. Let's go back and just let me read one verse to you from 1 Samuel 9, 24. So the cook took up the thigh with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, here is what he has kept for you. All right, Samuel's talking to Saul. We've kept this meat for you eat because it was set aside for you for this occasion from the time I said I have invited guests and Saul dined with Samuel that day. Now you go back and read the story again which we read in part or talked about it after Samuel was led to meet <clears throat> excuse me Saul was led to meet with, with uh, Samuel they had this fellowship meal with invited guests. Same things happening now. After that, Saul was anointed. So we see this fellowship offering again, including a meal, invited guest, uh, during this occasion, and the next king is recognized. Verse 4. And Samuel did what the Lord told, what the Lord told, and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? Now what's this all about? Well, Samuel was a prophet. He was a judge. And he was probably a priest because he followed after Eli. 
I don't think it's specifically stated, but I think many scholars believe he was. He had power and authority as we saw him kill off Agag. He had the word from God. So they're probably thinking, "Uh uh-oh, here comes Samuel. Uh, He has, uh, God has his ear, and he has a lot of power. And he's right next to the king. What's he have in mind for us? So the elders of Bethlehem were preparing themselves for whatever Samuel might do. So they say, do you come peaceably? It's the first thing they want to get out of the way. Are we going to all die, you might say? That's probably the worst that could happen. And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse, notice, and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So notice the parallel we just read with the meal, the fellowship, offering, and meal that Saul had. Invited guest, sacrificial meal, someone's being recognized. So both the elders of Bethlehem and Jesse and his sons are invited invited to the sacrifice. Jesse does not have David brought to the sacrifice. We'll see why in a moment. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought that would be the first son. Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Now, Eliab is the oldest son. 1728 tells us that. Let's look at his name for a moment. You know, we haven't done much Hebrew on the board for a while. Let me just give you the consonants of his name. Remember Hebrews from left to right. Um, Well, I'll go ahead and put this in. I'm going to go ahead and put in the vowels. These are sometimes hard to see, but I can, the advantage of having a computer, you can blow it up, you know, make it larger and you can see this. But this is the E-L, E-L, short word for uh, the Lord, or God, rather, Elohim, okay. Uh, This here is the word for my, so L. Um, I, you could translate it, I could translate it, God, my, then this is the word of, of, okay, Uh, pronounced like this, of, but you'll see it spelled like this, ob, that's father, God, my father. Apparently, Samuel is impressed by Eliab's appearance. Perhaps he was tall and handsome like Saul. So you'd think Samuel know better, but notice what happens. Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Notice his name, uh, my God is Father or God my Father. Well, that sounds like a good indicator. He was the oldest He's probably tall and handsome. So here we go. We ready to make the same mistake? Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me, before the Lord, he says. Samuel views this and states this as though the Lord is judging here before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. Now, this is a serious occasion. Is this the one the Lord has chosen? That's what we're seeing. In Psalms 89, 35 through 37, the Lord tells David that his throne is before him forever. I just think of the analogy of before him. Uh, So Samuel is saying, 
the next kings before him. But he's wrong. He needs a correction, and he gets that next. The Lord speaks to Samuel. Verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his statue, stature, because I have rejected him. So this is where you get the idea that he is looking at the appearance again and his height. Because I rejected him, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Folks, there's another wonderful issue to learn in this life of David. The Lord looks on the heart. From the Lord's response to Samuel, it appears Samuel is oppressed, impressed again by Eliab's, as it says, outward appearance. He looks at the heart. Let's look at that word for a moment. Just to show it to you, remind you, if you haven't been with me in my studies, this may be new to you, but I've taught it many times. The heart, in Hebrew it's lavav, the place of the thinking, the emotions, the values, the standards, the conscience, the memory. It's the inner man from which we live our lives. God looks at the inner person. To sum this up in one word, what's his character? What's his character? What does he believe? Uh, what are his values? Are they biblical values as we'd say today? Notice also this second sentence about the middle of our verse. For the Lord sees not as man sees. The Lord's not a man. He looks at the real person. This is a lesson for us also. Whether it be a friend, a mate, or even someone you do business with. The Lord was happy, you might say, because David fit the standards for a king. Learn this, folks. It's, it's a tough lesson in life because, well, people are people. You see somebody as a friend, and then they're your friend for maybe a couple of years, and they betray you. They find someone else they like better, and they betray you. And that spoils you on that person. Hopefully it doesn't help. Doesn't Let me put it this way. Hopefully that doesn't happen with a mate. You find out they betray you. It happens with many people in our lives, with our leaders. Uh, one of the big distrust I have developed in the last year, you might say, is doctors. We're raised to trust our doctors, and we do, and many are trustworthy, but many are not, especially with the tremendous amount of greed now. And I can go on about that, but uh, that's something that's really came out this last year and a half or so regarding this COVID thing. Well, that's another story. Maybe later. Now, the Lord looks at the heart. Not a man. The Lord is not a man. He looks at the real person. David fit the Lord's standards for a king. Now, when you compare this with the selection of Saul, this makes it seem like the Lord gave the people the type of king they wanted with Saul. Remember, they were rejecting him. They were rejecting the Lord as their king. But this time, it's the character of the man that God looks at. David's the one. David will set the standard for the greatest king of Israel until the Messiah himself comes. God looks on the heart. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Let's go to the dedication of the temple. Now this is later on with Saul, excuse me, Solomon, David's son. But what we're trying to see here is what the Lord looks at. Solomon's prayer of dedication 
it starts in 1 Kings 8, 22 and ends in 39. Let's just look at 39. We'll read the whole thing. You can go back and read that. 1 Kings 8, 22 through 39. Here's verse 39. Then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and act. Deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts. For you alone know every human heart. You know, one of the things that I've learned, and I'm still learning, we've got to depend on the Lord for everything. Because you don't know what that person will do in the future. You don't know what his real motive is, his character is. Even if you spend six months or a year with them. Well, David is speaking to his highest officials in this particular case, military officers, leaders of the different offices in his administration. His sons are present, including Solomon. So there's another incident I want you to look at here regarding the heart. It's a little long. First Chronicles 28.5. First Chronicles 28.5 reads, Of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So now we're a generation ahead of our story. He said to me, Solomon, your son, is the one who will build my house and my courts. That refers to the temple, of course. For I have chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. That's the special relationship between God in heaven and the king of Israel. I will be his father. Verse 7, I will establish his kingdom forever if he is unswerving in carrying out my commands and laws as is being done at this time. So now I charge you, remember David speaking, in the sight of all Israel and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God that you may possess this good land and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands everything every desire and every thought if you seek him he will be found by you that's a very important phrase if you seek him he'll be found by you but if you forsake him he'll reject you forever there are many big lessons here in this short reading Let's just look at one of them in particular. We've already seen how he understands every desire and every thought and the fact that God reads our hearts. If you seek him, last line, if you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Folks, I urge you to seek God every day. By that I mean get into the habit of meeting with him not only in prayer, but in the Word. Let Him speak to you through the teaching of the Word that day. Let these lessons that we learn about the life of David become so part of your thinking that you have an idea of what God's doing with you all the time. Now, sometimes you'll just be unaware of what God's doing. Later, you may find out and realize that was wonderful, that time actually, that relationship, that time at that place, doing that thing. Remember that God always has your best interest, but at the same time, he can read your heart. So you can't pull one over on him. Don't even try. Um, that is not very smart. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's just foolish. The final reference verse, let's look at the issue of the heart again. Jesus is speaking. Luke 16, 15. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Typical of the Pharisees to do something like this. 
Uh, we just saw Saul do that, justify himself. But God knew his heart. He knows our hearts. And what people think is great is sometimes an abomination in the sight of God. For in this case, it is when it comes to things and people like the Pharisees. Well, our story continues with Jesse bringing his sons before Samuel, verse 8. Let's look at the next son. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither, Samuel speaking, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Now let's look at his name for a moment. I won't go into the detail. I'll just show you the name itself in Hebrew and English. I can tell you what it means, Abinadab. My father is, genu uh, is, is genu generous. Excuse me. You can see the Av on the right side of the word. Uh, we just saw that in previous son's name. This has the word generous in it. On the left side of the word, my father's generous. Well, he wasn't the one either. Now this next one is interesting because it's a little tricky. You, uh, you kind of get a laugh out of this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this. And Shammah by itself means waste or horror. Now, who would name their kid waste or horror? horror? Um, but actually, Shammah is short or an abbreviation of his name, which is actually Shimia or Shimia, you'll you can see that in 2 Samuel 13, 3, where the son is named again, but this is a name he's given. So Shammah was probably a nickname, something of that sort. You want to see his real name, go to 2 Samuel 13, 3, and 32, or 21, 21. Well, the story goes on, and Jesse continued to bring, bring his sons in, brings his sons in. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Well, where is the son? Is this everybody? Well, that's a natural question. We expect Samuel to answer, and that's what he did. Ask rather, and he did. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Is that all the young men? Jesse replied, They were still the youngest one. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. It's kind of like, but look, he's, taking, he's keeping the sheep. Send and get him, for we cannot turn our attention to other things until he comes here. We can look at a few words here. The word for young men, uh, you'll see different translations on this. Uh, lads, uh, uh, men maybe, or just boys. But the word is, na'ar, it means boy or lad or youth. So we're talking about his sons, but they're older. Most of them are older, except for David, who's probably, my guess is he's, a, he's probably 17, 18 years old. And they still got him back there with the sheep. So he's a young man, the youngest of all these young men. Samuel knows that the Lord has not chosen any of these other sons, but the youngest has to come in. Now, let's look at this word youngest because it's worth looking at. The word is katan. It means youngest, but also smallest. And often the youngest is the smallest. So it could be he hasn't had his complete growth yet, or he's just a small in stature compared to the other brothers, but also can mean youngest. So it may mean both here. He's the youngest and the smallest, and that makes sense too. But he's said to be keeping the sheep. Now this in itself is a lesson because so many times sheep and shepherd are a metaphor in Scripture. It's a major metaphor in Scripture, as we should be aware. Before we get into some of those metaphors, let me, let me point out another one. 
What was Saul doing? Excuse me. What was, yes, what was Saul doing when the Lord was leading him to Samuel? He's looking for lost donkeys. David, in contrast, is keeping the sheep. Sheep, of course, is a metaphor for people, particularly subjects of Israel, subjects of the kingdom of Israel. Later in 2 Samuel 24, 17, David calls the people sheep. So we see the leader or king of Israel is again called the shepherd. He's a shepherd over the people. So the future king is a shepherd over sheep and will soon be shepherd over the sheep of Israel. A few verses, 2 Samuel 5, 2. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on the military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, this is talking of David, you will shepherd my people, Israel, and you'll become their ruler. Some other verses, I really want you to understand this is a common metaphor and it has a lot of implications. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. Ezekiel 34, 23, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, referring to Christ, And he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. Now we get into what we're familiar with regarding the New Testament. A good king is a good shepherd over his people. Oh, one more thing before we get to the New Testament. Let me remind you of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, in the New Testament, John 10, 11 And 14, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. That's 10, 11 and 10, 14 in John. So shepherd and sheep is a major metaphor in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now there's a lot more to say about this. And uh, we'll continue here next time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, again, we thank you for your word today, the challenge you've presented to us, the many lessons. Uh, Lord, help us not only learn them, but through your spirit, believe them and properly apply them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.